thank you all for coming. Um, I'm talking today about uh, Erlang disk filtering in the WhatsApp runtime system. Um, and these slides and the source for them are all available on um, my website or on GitHub um, under Luxicomp 2023. Um, so my name is Andrew Bennett. And um, I grew up in, uh, so, so I, I live right now in, in Texas with my wife. And we have two daughters and a uh, little white whippet named Lizzie. Uh, uh, and uh, I grew up in Georgia, though. So we used this, this opportunity this last weekend to kind of have like a mini family reunion with my side of the family. And so my parents were able to come down. We were able to go to Disney World and everything. So there's, uh, I asked my mom beforehand if it was OK to use this picture. But we discovered that like every photo we took of her, her eyes were closed. So uh, <laughs> she, she said she was OK with it. Uh, yeah, it was fun you know, hanging out and, uh, you know, my sister's family and my brother and, yeah, it was a lot of fun for everyone. Um, you may have seen me on, on GitHub before as Potato Salad. I'm also on uh, Potato Salad X on Twitter, or X. I had that username before Elon got his hands on the company. But the, uh, I'm also Potato Salad X on, on threads and anything meta-related, but not, not, you know, for the, sa for the, for the same reason. Um, I discovered after joining the company that there's a conference room down in Austin, Texas that has my username. Uh, reserved, so that's the reason I couldn't couldn't get it without the X. Uh, so, th for this talk, um, I'm going to be covering three main topics: the uh, distribution protocol itself, um, then the Erlang disk uh, filtering project, and then a little bit about the WhatsApp runtime system um, that we're kind of kicking off now in soonish. Um, so, the distribution protocol. Um, I like that the docs for it in the like the OTP docs mentioned that. The description is far from complete, and so my description is also far from complete. But uh, we're going to go through it anyway. So uh, for context, uh, WhatsApp clusters. Um, so WhatsApp itself, uh, the back end receives about, has about 2 billion uh, daily active users. And we have fairly large clusters. Uh, they average around 30,000 nodes right now. And um, we have really large peak traffic. So this was a, a graph from a network outage that resulted in kind of all, all everyone who's connected, you know, trying to log back in from their, you know, you know, at the same time. And we, we hit about 1.2 billion uh, queries per second. And I had a, had a, one of my colleagues, Joyu, uh, made a post about you know, his new, some of the changes they'd made to overload protection and saying, hey, look, look at this giant spike, and everything worked. And anyway, I thought this was funny. One of my other colleagues made this little meme uh, that 1.2 billion QPS is not, is not normal uh, traffic that you see every day. Um, now, the way that WhatsApp is kind of set up on the back end is we have these different types of services represented here by like A, B, C, D, and E, and F. They're all kind of interconnected to a single kind of main chat service, A, here. Um, and we use um, th the disk protocol to actually communicate between all the different services. And um, the net effect, though, with this kind of s architecture, the setup, is that you end up with a full mesh. So you end up having either transitive or direct, direct connections to all the other nodes within the cluster. And so um, anyway, that's kind of quick overview of kind of what's up set up in the back end. Um, Erlang disk itself, the disk protocol, um, is fairly simple. It, it starts off with a really uh, basic handshake that has um, checks that both nodes are using the same cookie. Um, it's bidirectional. There's no defined client or server. And um, it's stateful. So there's a little over 2,000 atom cache references. In, which allows you to, so if you're sending the same atom a bunch of times to another node, you don't actually send the whole atom. You just send like a reference to that atom on the other side. And so the connection itself holds that state. And things like links, unlinks, exits, monitors, aliases, and spawn replies are all stateful. So if the connection goes down, all of those things get dropped. So if you have a link to a process on another node, um, if the connection goes down, you get a exit message, um, regardless of whether or not the other process actually went down or not. So um, it's also fragmented. So um, if you're sending a very large message over 64 kilobytes, it will break it up into 64 kilobyte chunks. And so that allows you to send a very large message without blocking all of the other messages that you might want to send to this other node. It's smaller messages. Um, it's also sequentially traceable. So trace tokens are supported for most of the control messages, but some of them aren't. Um, now, I say control messages. Uh, these are basically dist operations. Uh, so if you, th like from HTTP, if you were you know, like a get operation or a post or patch or what, put whatever you're doing, um, those would be control messages as far as uh, the disk protocol is concerned. So you have things like group leader, payload exit to, link, monitor, you know, registered sending to a registered process, send sender, alias send, and spawn request and spawn reply. These are the control messages. Some of them have a payload associated with them. So if I'm sending a message to another node, sending basically contain or like send sender contains the PID I'm sending from, and then to, and then the payload would be whatever message I'm actually sending. 
Um, some of them, like group leader, don't have a payload. It's just telling the node, hey, set this other process's uh, group leader to this PID. Um, <clears throat> so a quick demonstration of like how you would, what code would result in a send sender kind of happening over the wire. Um, so uh, the spec, you know, for sending, if I'm sending to a PID, any message type, uh, if I start a node called foo at, at localhost, and I do you know, term to binary on self, and I get back this binary back, and then I'm going to start a, another node called bar at localhost, and I'm going to do binary to term on this blob that came out up above, and I have a PID now. And so I can send to this PID, you know, hello PID from bar, and then back over on the foo node, I received that atom that was sent from the bar node. That's rough, so over the wire, that behind the scenes, send sender happened. Like the connection was established automatically and everything worked. You can also send messages to a registered process. So if you don't know the PID of another node, you don't want to do the whole you know, term to binary thing or whatever you're using for discovering the PID on another node, you can instead send uh, um, a tuple that has the registered name on the other node and then the node name itself. And so I can register on the foo node, I can register this process, the shell process to the name foo shell. And then on the bar node, I can send to foo shell, comma, foo at localhost, and then whatever I want to send. And that also works. Um, this is kind of two examples of, of ways that you can send two different types of disk operations over the wire. Let's show a third one, um, spawn request. So in this case, we're assigning caller to self, or self to caller, there we go. And we're going to do a spawn request on bar from the foo node. And we're going to send back to the caller from node self, so we can kind of double check that we're running this code on this other node. And the last thing we're going to do is actually halt, um, which will kill the bar node. Wh whether that was intentional or not, you're going to kill the bar node. So if we flush, um, we'll see that we got a spawn reply with this PID right here. And the PID uh, also matches our sent message, the from bar, and then the PID that's there. Um, but the, da the, the bad news is, is the bar node is now dead. Like, just shut down immediately. Um, and so let's see what other kind of mayhem we can cause. Um, so we can run this, which recursively halts all nodes. We can recursive, this one's fun. You can recursively shut down Erlang disks. The nodes are still running, but they can't talk to each other. Um, you can flood the network with an eventual OOM, which is, uh, which is especially fun because this will also persist across deploys if any new nodes talk to the old nodes. Um, same thing with this one, continuous forced code swap. So you can, you know, be, you know, pur I forgot the purge step in here, but you could purge a, no a module and load, load bytecode in for a different module. And this would also persist across uh, if you're doing like a rolling deploy or anything like that that connects to old nodes. Um, now, most of, the node, most of the examples so far rely on ERPC, but let's say you've somehow disabled spawn request. Well, you can still accomplish it without that. Um, we can send a gen cast to the rex process using registered send, and we can accomplish remote code execution. We can, uh, without spawn request or without rex, we can instead ask the kernel supervisor to start up a child for us on the other node, uh, which allows us to do remote code execution. We can, without any of those things, we can instead just do an I.O. request. So just printing something can also result in remote execution on another node. So there's a lot of different ways that are just built into to the beam uh, for you to, whether you meant to or not, you know, m mess, up, uh, mess up other nodes that are in the cluster. And when your cluster size is 30,000 nodes, the blast radius is a lot larger than, uh, th than normal. So um, in, in its defense, it does say this in the docs, that the early distribution protocol is not by itself secure and does not aim to be so. It, it wasn't designed for this necessarily. It wasn't designed for this kind of, tr it's designed for very trusted, small environments where, you know, everything was trusted. Um, and we've got these kind of, at, the, at, at certain scales though, you're kind of in this weird, mostly trusted environment. Whether it's intentional or not, someone could accidentally either deploy code on a new node or they're performing a canary or they're you know, doing an experiment or whatever they're doing that inadvertently wipes out large parts of the cluster. Um, so Erlang disk filtering, uh, what is it? It's a NIF that intercepts uh, and rewrites inbound disk traffic. Um, it's available on, Git on GitHub. Um, the README is very sparse. That's my fault. I'll fix, I'll fix that soon. Uh, is either finish the presentation or finish the README. Uh, anyway, um, so the two main parts of the uh, of the NIF or, or the project are loggers, uh, which are stateful. Um, there's no signal ordering, so you could 
you might actually get the ordering in the logger that's different from the way that the node received it because signal ordering is only preserved at a uh, connection level, like not between, not, anyway. If that matters to you, you know about no signal ordering now. So, uh, and it's lossy. So if the, we wanted to make sure that when we were logging these events that were coming in, um, if someone happened to deploy code that was potentially spamming one of the other nodes, we didn't want to have the logger be the reason that the, that the node like OMs or whatever. So um, it will drop things if the, if the, the like the, the processor can't keep up. And so the other portion of the project is handlers, which are lossless and they do preserve signal ordering and they're stateless. Um, they, uh, it's lossless in quotes because technically if the node becomes overloaded, it can go down. Same thing with disconnections themselves, they can die or TCP connections can die. But um, loggers are basically meant to just audit things as they're happening over the wire and then handlers can be used to rewrite things or redirect things. Um, and those are kind of the callbacks for the behaviors that are set up. Um, let's, give, let's go through a quick demonstration of the loggers. Um, we're going to set up two nodes, foo and bar. I'm using IPv6 now because it's a little shorter. Um, and so you would specify the, like a proto dist thing when you're starting up the beam, and you could specify earliest filter on at six TCP, um, and that would allow that you that would switch based on whether you're using it to be 25 or 26 um, to the correct module that needs to be used for that. Um, that enables dist filtering. Um, great. So we've got these two nodes set up, foo and bar. We're going to ping bar. That's it. So um, now we're going to try to figure out what happened during that ping, like what actual dist operations were sent over the wire. Um, and we can do that with, with loggers. So we're going to have a module here called my dist logger. We've got a behavior um, uh, tag or whatever. And then um, in, this, in this logger, we're going to have just a queue. So any events that come in, we're going to put them in the queue. And then we'll have a separate function for being able to actually like dump the queue and then yeah, so we can kind of inspect the, thing, the events that happen in there. There's a callback for it called handle batch, which allows you to kind of inspect or potentially report to some, some alarm device, you know, alarm service that you might have if you're dropping too much. So you'll get a report of how many is the size of the batch and then how many were dropped within this batch. And then um, you can decide whether, depending on the overload protection you might want to have in your, in your app, you can either process the batch events or you can drop them. Um, and so uh, the two main callbacks are handle control, control event and handle payload event. And here we're casting it to a record and then just storing it in the queue in both of these cases, control and payload. And uh, here's our boilerplate code for being able to export the queue uh, from a call, basically is kind of what this is. So great. We can start it up with this uh, child spec handler or helper. We're gonna have one logger. And then we can run my dist, my dist logger export and we'll get back a list that looks like this. Um, so we can see, so the, the number here on the left will actually be like a monotonic number, so it'll be a lot longer than that, but it kind of helps show the ordering of the, of the events as they happen. And then you can see that there was a monitor event or a monitor dist operation registered send. You can see kind of where they were going. Oh, there's something happening from Phoenix Pub Sub here. You can kind of get an idea of what the dist traffic that's actually happening from all other nodes that are connecting to this, to this current node. Um, so going, it, that was a bunch of stuff. Going back to what we're actually trying to solve, what in the world happens during this ping? Um, so that was all the boilerplate and setup to get, be able to accomplish that. So what happened here? Foo pinged bar. So what did foo send to bar? So let's go over on the bar node and take a look. Um, so we're on bar. We're looking at what did foo send me. First, a monitor was sent to the net kernel process with this reference here. And then a registered send was sent to the net kernel process. And the tag that's being used in this gen call is the same as the monitor step that happened right before that. And it basically asks, am I authorized? You know, is the foo node authorized? Finally, there's a demonitor step. And so this reference that kind of lives, lives through here is an alias. Um, and so you're, able, you're basically able to use the same monitor that, that was used in this first step to actually reply to the message to the ping. And so jumping over to the foo node, we can see that there was a single dist operation and alias send, and it just replied with yes, and it used the, uh, the monitor reference to be able to actually reply. So three messages or three dist operations were sent to the bar node. One dist operation was sent to the foo node during a single ping. And anyway, all of that is, it, you can see with loggers, 
Now, you may be asking yourself a very important question at this point, because um, this is pretty dry. This is, you know, like, what, what are you going to use this for? Uh, in, unless you're like, actually looking into, into debugging the disk protocol, you can use it for that. Um, what's more useful or what we're using it within WhatsApp is for detecting unexpected traffic. So we basically have, you know, we're not logging every single piece of traffic that happens that's expected. We're basically, we have it there as a safety net in case we're starting to see things that are unexpected happening in the cluster. Um, it could be during a SEV or like an outage or something like that. Maybe developers trying to fix something in production or test something. Um, but we'll at least be able to have an, a paper trail of like who did it and when, what time, and what you know. And we can go investigate further about why that why that needed to be done in the cluster. Handlers, on the other hand, um, unlike loggers, which are just kind of passively kind of recording history, handlers can be used to kind of alter the request that was sent over the wire. So in this case, uh, we're going to get a list of nodes. We've got bar, as Hux from the foo node. And we're going to do a multi-call where we're just asking the system version. And, we can, and then we're kind of zipping that together with the list of nodes. So bar replied with 1.15.4. Same thing with Baz. And then Quux lives in a different universe where Elixir is allowed to bump its major version. And uh, we're going to do the same thing again. But this time, we're going to do system halt. And we see here that we get back you know, exit, exception, and authorized. Now, normally, if you were to run this command that I just showed here, those nodes would be dead, like immediately. And so how did we actually change, you know, the system halt to instead return an a exception unauthorized um, with a handler? So we can have a callback here for spawn request init that intercepts the module function and er arguments that are being sent or are being requested to be run on, the, on this other node. And the sysname here is the name of the other node. So you could actually have different behavior depending on what node you're talking to. Um, and so in this case, we're basically kind of unpacking this, and we see that it's an ERPC execute call request, unpack it further, and we see that, hey, they're trying to ask for the system version, and we allow that to run. Otherwise, we rewrite it to just instead call this module's unauthorized thing, which uh, returns exit unauthorized. And for anything else that isn't an ERPC request, we just go ahead and exit un unauthorized. So this allowed us to still support spawn requests, but we were able to kind of control about uh, like what you're allowed to do from node to node. Um, and you can also do classification based on uh, like payload-related messages. So not, not spawn requests, but like registered sends or, or uh, sends to PIDs or alias sends or whatever. So in this example, um, let's say we want to allow other nodes to be able to send to my trusted process on this node, um, and only that process. And so anything else we're going to drop. And this is an example of how you might do that. And then you can also allow for alias replies to also happen to this node. Um, and then anything else, you can use the hint that the NIF provides. So we've got some kind of built-in things to kind of tell you whether or not we think this is, should be dropped, or if it's safe, or if it's unsafe. And so you can use those hints or not. Technically, you could change the drop to a keep if you want, whatever you want to do, uh, based on what, whatever you're matching on. Um, so classification and then spawn request init are the two kind of main parts of a handler. So an important aspect of this for us it was that we needed a very quick way to be able to break the glass in case it's getting in the way. If there's an outage or there's a you know, sev or something like that, and we need to be able to very quickly push a hotfix out or whatever we need to do. Um, so you can very easily turn off deep packet inspection, and on the fly, this will stop what it's doing. It, uh, the disconnections will continue to be up and running, but it will no longer like rewrite the things as they're coming in. Um, and so one of the ways that you can use this is you can put this behind a spawn request function uh, that accepts set some uh, credentials of some kind. It could be a shared password owned by the on-call group that is you, you know, single use, and then you change it. Or it could be uh, you know, a token that's signed or something like that, whatever you want to use so that uh, the on-call group is able to turn it off if needed. And then you can have that reported somewhere, and then you can go through and, and do whatever follow-up you need to do for why it was disabled. Um, statistics, uh, there, I think there's about 150 data points that it currently collects, that the NIF does. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can output global statistics about, so if, if you want to find out like how many alias sends are happening, or have I received on this node from all disconnections, you can see that by using this function. You can also see per channel, so like each channel is, is a disconnection to another, to another node. You can also inspect like the atom cache 
to find out what atoms are being seen most frequently between nodes and a bunch of other stuff that's in there too that can be useful for debugging. Um, you can also see on an individual logger how many were dropped versus received if your system is being overloaded. And uh, so like a real world example of this would be, um, so this is a, um, a message node um, or chat node um, that we have on, uh, for the WhatsApp backend. And uh, so uh, th this test, the node was not overloaded. I think this was just kind of normal midday lower end of the traffic hit. Um, so we were getting about 1.3 million uh, queries per minute, which works out to a few tens of thousands of queries per second for send sender. And then registered send um, is the next most frequent thing. We've got some monitors, monitor exits and demonitors that are kind of happening. And so this has been useful uh, for us as we've kind of watched it more over time. We found that the, the gossip, the chatter that's happening for the registered send is mostly from PG processes that are dealing with processes, joining and leaving groups and coming up and down or whatever they're doing. And so this is an area that we're, you know, um, continuing to investigate and to try to optimize so that we can bring this down because the main event is up here, you know, the send senders that are happening, that's actual, you know, customer traffic that we want to, that we want to uh, prioritize. Um, so, um, the, uh, last thing I want to ch chat about briefly is the WhatsApp runtime system itself. And um, this is from a recent team meeting where I said, I'm going to call it warts if nobody else has a better idea. Says the guy whose name is potato salad with potentially an X. Um, and so it is, so warts is the runtime used in production by a large portion of, of WhatsApp. Um, it's a friendly fork of OTP. It's, it's based on the main branch. As of today, that's OTP 26. So next year, whenever they come up with 27, it'll be based on that. And it's available under WhatsApp slash warts. Um, the primary focus right now is on improvements to performance, security, debugging, and tooling for Linux. And then the secondary focus is support for macOS development. And that's all we're really focusing on right now, because uh, that's what we use. And um, the features that are available on it right now are transparent huge pages support on Linux. Um, and kernel or KTLS support for disk filtering on Linux. And there's, there's some, some other things related to that that um, help improve performance. If, if you do happen to use this on Linux, it, uh, we've seen about 20% uh, performance improvement from, from this. Um, there's also an incremental or faster dialogue support. Um, some of this has already been merged upstream and some of it is just is still being actively worked on. Um, so we're kind of letting folks, if, if you're interested, use it early while, while we're working on it and getting it upstreamed. Um, we also have a bunch of heat profiling and memory debugging tools that we've been working on um, that are integrated into the Beam. And um, there's more features to come that, that uh, historically we've worked on these things kind of internally and then kind of sent them upstream. That way we're kind of making them uh, available as we're working on them instead. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, we want to be able to have binary packages and all that stuff soon, but yeah, it's still it's beginning right now. And that is it. Um.